This is Laura Cross of Rebel Seed Studio for Military Dispatch. You're listening to a bonus episode of the audio documentary, Battlefield Fallujah. This episode features author and Vietnam combat Marine veteran, Colonel Dick Camp, who shares his insights on writing the book, Operation Phantom Fury, The Assault and Capture of Fallujah, Iraq, and talks about the significance of the battle. From earliest that I can remember, I always wanted to be a Marine, and one of my coaches in high school was a former Marine artilleryman from Korea, and he kind of cemented my idea that I wanted to be a Marine. One time over Christmas break from college, I took my mother to Syracuse, New York, and while she was shopping, I went in and and enrolled in the officer candidate program. Then when I graduated from college, I went into officer candidate school at Quantico and uh, was fortunate enough to get through the damn thing and was commissioned a second lieutenant and then went to the basic school. My first duty station, by the way, it was a tough, but somebody's got to do it, Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii. I was an infantry officer and I took over a platoon in 3rd Battalion, 4th Regiment, and then I went from there to a reconnaissance platoon. And then after my two years in Hawaii, I went back to the Marine Barracks in Washington, D.C., the ceremonial post of the Corps, and I was the special ceremonial platoon that has the silent drill team and the body bearers at at Arlington and the color guard of the Marine Corps. So I got off to a great start in the Marines and spent two years at the Marine Barracks and then received orders to the Republic of South Vietnam. I went over, I think it was about June of 67, bad timing on my part, uh, because there was heavy combat at that particular stage, left my wife and young daughter in Indianapolis, Indiana, went to Camp Pendleton for two weeks of reconnaissance replacement school, which was basically a fire support school, which was good for me, and then went into Vietnam to the 3rd Marine Division, which was in the Northern I Corps. It was interesting reporting in because I had served in the 4th Regiment and I wanted to go back to that. So when I got into the division adjutant, I told him, I said, I want any company in the 4th Marines. And he kind of looked at me like, who the heck do you think you are, buddy? I do the assignments. So I explained it to him why I wanted to go in there. He looked at his roster and he says, there's no openings in the 4th Regiment. And I said, okay, I'll take any rifle company in the 3rd Marine Division that's open. And he looked at his roster again. He says, okay, I've got a rifle company now in the 3rd Battalion, 26th Marines. I said, great, I'll take it. And as I stepped away, it was one of those throwaway lines. I said, company commander, rotate. And he said, no, he was killed in action last night. So that certainly got my attention right there. Worked my way on up by helicopter to at the place called Dong Ha, which was just below the demilitarized zone. Took over... And then I flew from there to Quezon. This was before the siege. And my rifle company was out in the field, joined them out there. And then from that point on, we served around the 3rd Marine Division for about seven months. During the siege, I was at the siege of Quezon. And one day, the battalion exec, Major Carl Mundy, who eventually became the commandant, said, Dick, how would you like to be an aide to camp? And I had no idea what an aide did. So I said, yeah, will it get me out of Quezon? He said, absolutely. I said, I'll take it, rather tongue-in-cheek, and went down and became the division commander's aide. The general officer was Major General Raymond G. Davis, and I had no idea who that was at the time and subsequently found out that he was probably one of the most highly decorated and heroic Marines in the Corps. Medal of Honor, Navy Cross, Silver Stars, and every personal decoration that you can receive for bravery in combat. And that formed a relationship with General Davis that lasted for several years. 
I finished being his aide in Vietnam, came back, and he came back to Quantico, and I became his aide back here, and it was just a tremendous experience for me as a junior officer to see a, a real hero, but also a very extremely intelligent officer maneuver the division first in combat, and then how he was able to work his magic with the educational system here at Quantico, Virginia. So that started me off and was really great footing for me. As a result of my experiences as a rifle company commander, I wrote a book called Lima Six, a Marine Company Commander in Vietnam, and it describes my experiences as a company commander in 1967 and 1968 in the Northern I Corps. 1967 and 68 were really bad times because the North Vietnamese were coming across the border in main force units, battalion and regiment, and there was heavy combat, uh, tremendous casualties. It was a tough time for the Marine Corps. So I wrote that book. It was one of those things, a labor of love, and it was really interesting because over the years I've gotten calls from men who served with me, and usually it's late at night. I always answer the phone, Dick Camp, and they say, Skipper, do you remember me? And, of course, they'll give me their name, and it's been 30 or 40 years. And unfortunately, I don't remember many of their names. It was really an interesting experience. Thoroughly enjoyed it, primarily because it put me in touch with former members that I served with in Vietnam. I was in Cincinnati, Ohio. I wanted to write about the 4th Regiment in China, and they were captured and spent 48 months as prisoners of war. I had a lot of letters, and I interviewed a lot of people, and so I wrote a couple of articles and sent it into Leatherneck Magazine. Sent them in, just in the blind, and the editor, Bill White, called me and said, we'll take your articles, and I was absolutely amazed. I said, you will, surprised. So I said, well, I've got a couple more, so I kept sending them in, and fortunately they published them. And that got me into the writing business. After a while, you know, you develop a style, and you just kind of find a topic, and then in your style you produce that. And I've been very fortunate to do that. I've got over probably 100-plus articles in various military-related magazines, and it also got me started in writing books. I went from Cincinnati back to Quantico, Virginia, to become the uh, assistant director of history division. You know, great job for a Marine. And while I was there, of course, the men are coming back, the officers are coming back from deployment, primarily Iraq at that stage in the game. And so I started interviewing them, and that got me involved in writing about Iraq and Fallujah. Plus, when I came back to Quantico, I stayed with General Jim Mattis for several weeks. And, of course, I listened to Jim talk about his experiences in Iraq, leading the division, and, and so it really cemented my ideas to look at Iraq and to start producing books and articles. And I write oral history, so to be able to interview the veterans really was a great thing for me. I wanted to take a look at Fallujah, first of all, because it was one of the largest marine battles, in fact, one of the largest battles in the Iraq War. And again, an awful lot of the veterans were coming back through, including the regimental commanders, plus Jim Mattis having done the first operation in Fallujah, and I talked to him about it. And so really that cemented my idea on why I wanted to write about Fallujah, plus the men were right there. And so I could interview them. Also at Quantico, History Division is located right there. And one of the branches of History Division is the Oral History Branch. And a good friend of mine runs it. I asked him if he had any oral histories from Fallujah. And come to find out, he had over 30 oral histories of veterans who served in Fallujah who they took the oral history from. The significance was it was a huge city. We, the Marine Corps, had not fought in a combat in a build-up area since Korea. And so it was a whole new type of operation. Certainly in Vietnam, it was more of uh, trying to find the North Vietnamese and then having sharp battles. Way City, of course, was a build-up area. But really, Fallujah was a division size operation to eliminate insurgents and stop them from killing Americans, use of IEDs and hit-and-run attacks. And it was a short operation. I think oral history makes a story come alive, and that's what I like to write.
It was stark realism because you're talking to men who took the fight right to the enemy. And, you know, the insurgents were always saying, well, the Americans don't have the stomach for face-to-face battles. We always use air support and artillery. But in Fallujah, that individual rifleman with his rifle and bayonet took the fight to the enemy in houses, in small confined spaces, And I think the insurgents learned that we're not afraid to take them on face-to-face and really take the fight right to them. What people should remember about Fallujah is that their sons took the fight right to the enemy in face-to-face, hand-to-hand combat and did a magnificent job. What it cemented in my view was that this generation that fought in Fallujah were every bit as good if not better, than any generation of American fighting men.